Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, this is my true crime podcast called Behind You, where once a week I sit down and I talk about all things true crime, ranging from murders, cults, disappearances, all the way from the biggest drug bust in history to the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're into any of that, you can subscribe on the YouTube channel, Haley Elizabeth, and watch the visual version every Wednesday, or you can head over to Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts and listen to the audio version every Tuesday. And in today's case, we are going to be talking about the case of William Nelson. Now, there is a lot to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. Omaima Ari Nelson was born in 1968 in southern Egypt near the Sudan border. Omaima had no siblings, so she was an only child and she was raised by her mother and her father, but her father was said to be very abusive to her growing up. He was a very big alcohol abuser and every time he would get drunk, he would physically, emotionally, and sexually abuse Omaima. And he did this to both Omaima and her mother. At just six years old, Omaima went through what was called female circumcision, which is unfortunately very common in Egypt, which from UNF pa.org fgm or female circumcision quote refers to all procedures involving partial or total removal of the external female genitals or other injury to the female genitalia for either cultural or non-medical reasons and so omaima went through that female circumcision when she was just six years old by the hands of her father and this procedure is unfortunately very common in egypt Egypt with a whopping 92% of women and girls ages 15 to 49 in Egypt that say that they have gotten some form of FGM and usually these female circumcisions are either done by doctors but most of the time they're done by family members with little to no medical experience. And the reason why these female circumcisions are so terrible is because it offers no health benefits and it can cause things such as severe bleeding, urination problems, cysts, infections, infertility, and increased risk of newborn deaths. And this is just like a side note, but reading into female circumcision and FGM was such a wild thing to read into. I did not know that things like this happened and because not only is it like a huge violation of a human right, you know, these girls are being subjected to this terrible thing and they're not old enough to really make the decision for themselves or even old enough to understand the risk that they're putting their body at. And as I said, these female circumcisions are usually cosmetic or for non-medical reasons, meaning that there is no reason they should be getting these medical procedures. It's basically upon their family's personal preference. But thankfully, in 2007, the Egyptian Ministry of Health issued a ministerial decree banning everyone, including health professionals, from performing FGM in governmental or non-governmental hospital slash clinics. So as of 2007, this was banned. No one can perform a female circumcision anymore because of the dangers that it provides to the women. Um, I think it is different in male circumcision in a way that, um, like, I don't think male circumcision has that many health risks. I'm not sure. I don't know. I didn't, re- I didn't really read into that. But anyway, going off track, let's get back on track. So when Omaima was six years old, she went through that female circumcision and after that, she just continued to endure a lot of abuse from her father and so did her mother. Her mother was also very abused by her father, but in this case, Omaima's father was just a very scary man and so Omaima's mother just didn't know what to do. She was too scared to leave him until one day she did get the courage to leave him. When they left, however, they left with just the clothes on their backs and the money in their pockets, so they were homeless for a very long time, and they ended up moving to a small town in Cairo, and this little town was a very poor town, and it was actually referred to, quote, the city of the dead, because all of the housing or the shacks were uh, made around tombstones. 
But although her and her mom lived in poverty, they didn't really mind it because they much rather prefer living this life than a life with Omaima's abusive father. So it was just Omaima and her mother, they became very, very close, they became best friends, and they just basically grew up together. And then in 1986, when Omaima was 18 years old, that is when she met an American oil worker who was visiting Egypt for a business trip. And apparently her and this man really hit it off and ended up dating, but because of the sexual abuse that Omaima had endured as a kid, sexual relations were very, very painful for her and she didn't enjoy them at all. It was just something that she did because she felt like she needed to do it. And also, since her father was the only male figure in her life, so she just kind of had this blank idea for all men, and this was a big reason why she tended to steer away from relationships. And also, with her mother and her father, Omaima growing up just never really had a good example of a healthy relationship, and so since she didn't know what a healthy relationship was, she just found it a lot easier to not be in one at all. So when she met this oil worker, she was dating him, but she was just trying to avoid him, sort of, like just kind of avoid him and hope that he just goes away. So she's telling all of this to her mother and she's like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to really go out with this American man. I just don't really feel like it's good for me. I just don't have a good relationship with men. And she's telling all of this to her mother and her mother's like, girl what are you talking about like you got the, you got the ticket to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory right now you need to go to America you need to marry this man you need to live a beautiful life for yourself you're gonna go to the land of the free with many opportunities you can do whatever you want like go live your life and so Omaima is like you know what yeah of course like I deserve a healthy relationship and I deserve to be happy with this man I'm going to do it. Like, I'm going to pursue a relationship with this man. And if he takes me back to America and we end up getting married, then so be it, you know? And it was said that this guy that she dated was actually a really, really nice guy. He treated Omaima with a lot of respect and he treated her well. He never really pushed things on her that she didn't want to do. And he also had a lot of money in the States as well. He was very romantic. So when this man's work trip ends, he ends up leaving Egypt and taking Omaima with him. And so the couple goes back to the man's house in Texas. Prior to Omaima coming to the States, she had this beautiful, you know, plan for herself. She envisioned herself living this luxurious lifestyle with her husband and raising kids in America and having all these opportunities to do all of these jobs and have all this money and just create a better life for herself. She had a lot of hopes for this American dream. But when she actually came to the States, she was faced with the unfortunate reality. Since Omaima was Egyptian and a person of color, a lot of parts in Texas are very racist. And so when she got here, she was faced with a lot of racism. She didn't speak that good of English. And so every time she spoke English to people, they didn't know what she was saying and would just give her a hard time. She didn't have a job. She didn't have any money. All the money that she had was the man that she was seeing. All of his money was basically her money and she couldn't get a job because she didn't speak English and everybody was just discriminating her. And so she went into this thinking that she was going to be living this magical lifestyle, but it turns out that although there are a lot of opportunities in America, she wasn't being given any of those opportunities because of the color of her skin. So she felt extremely lost here. She felt like she couldn't relate to anyone. She felt like an outcast. And so she was just having a miserable time. And so her and her boyfriend sat down and they mutually agreed that it would be in both of their best interests if they just split up, if Omaima went out there and attempted to, you know, see the world for herself and make something of herself without her boyfriend there. 
So to make money, Omaima picked up on some side jobs, such as being a housekeeper and a nanny. And whilst she was picking up all of these odd jobs just to make some money and try to fund herself, you know, give herself a little place to stay in, that is when she took a big interest into modeling. All her life, she had always been complimented about her facial features and how pretty she was and her high cheekbones. And she had always wanted to go into modeling modeling. She felt like it was just such a, you know, luxurious lifestyle to live. She felt like, you know, it was the perfect job for her because she was pretty and she loved getting dressed up. She loved putting on makeup and it was a job that you necessarily didn't really have to talk that much in, meaning that she wouldn't even have to know that much English to get around. So she pursued modeling and she was pretty good at it too. She was making a lot of things for her portfolio through this, but also through modeling is when she would meet a bunch of rich old men. A lot of these men that she would meet were completely blown away by her beauty and were willing to spend a lot of money on her, to which Omaima gladly accepted. So through this, that is what Omaima started doing. She started to accept money from men and would make it sort of a routine. So she would pretend to be interested in men. She would date them and there were some instances where she would move in with them just a couple days after knowing him. But all while she was with these men, she would pocket a lot of their money. She would spend a lot of their money. She would put some of their money that she was stealing into a savings account. So when she left that guy to go on to the next guy, she would have some money to keep her afloat in the meantime. And whenever these relationships ended, it always went one or two ways. It was either her breaking it off with them because she was bored or she found someone new, or it would be him breaking off with her because they realized that she was just simply taking money from him. And this cycle went on for years and years of her just completely, you know, manipulating men into falling in love with her, taking all of their money and then leaving and having absolutely no empathy for them at all. She never felt bad that she was manipulating them or breaking their heart or how they felt about her stealing his money. She didn't really care about that. She basically just took his money and went on to the next guy. So then in 1991, at 23 years old, that is when Omaima decided to move from Texas to Orange County, California to then pursue modeling. And one night she's at a pool bar with a couple of her friends and that is when she meets 56-year-old William Nelson, aka Bill. A lot of people called him Bill as a nickname. Bill was born in 1935 in Texas and he was actually a former pilot, but he had actually lost his job as a pilot after he was caught smuggling drugs into the United States. So due to this crime, he actually served four years in prison and then when he came out, it was very hard for him to find a job, but eventually after years of hard work, he was able to work himself up to a wealthy business. Businessman. And how people described Bill is that he was the type of person that just by looking at him, you knew he had money. From the suits he wore, the watches he had, the bright red Corvette that he drove around, all of his properties... He would also always wear these super bright red cowboy boots to match his red Corvette. And so literally just by looking at Bill, you knew he had money. He was very flashy with it. And so when Bill saw Omaima at this pool bar, he was just completely blown away by her beauty and he went up to talk to her. And so as Bill is going on and on about how much money he makes, all these cars that he owns, all these properties properties, all of the success in all of these businesses that he has, Omaima is immediately hooked. She's like, the boy is mine, you know, like he, he's going to be mine. I'm going to take his money. He's bragging to me about all this money he has. 
like obviously I'm gonna go for it. So at the end of the night after the couple are talking it up that is when Omaima walks up to the bar and she goes to pay her tab but then Bill kind of comes in and pulls out just a wad of cash and hands it to the bartender and looks to Omaima and says tonight's on me and immediately from that Omaima's like okay um he is mine I'm gonna take his money because he clearly has a lot of it and I'm just gonna I'm gonna sit here for as long as I can so the couple began dating and actually just a couple of days after knowing each other the first time they met from the bar the couple got married and Omaima agreed to pack up all of her things in California and move back to Texas where her and Bill would live in his luxury penthouse apartment and so So through this, the couple decided to make a honeymoon out of their road trip back to Texas. And so Bill, as I said, Bill is 56 years old. So he has some kids. And so all of his kids and his ex-wife live in Arkansas. So on their way from California to Texas, they take a little detour into Arkansas. So Bill can basically come home and be like, hey guys, here's your new (laughs) stepmom. Like we're married now. And so he introduces Omaima to his family in Arkansas and they're due to stay at the house for three days and when the family first meets Omaima they were very you know put off by it they thought that she was super super young I mean Omaima was younger than some of his kids they thought that she was super young like she's clearly just using him for their father's money they didn't really like her too much and then by the end of the trip the family's perspective kind of changed uh Omaima sort of grew on them and they were like you know what she's pretty, she's funny, she seems sweet, what, you know, what's the harm in it, you know, like, what if they actually do love each other, and from the family's perspective, they said that when Bill had brought Omaima home, he seemed madly in love with Omaima, like, Bill was not the type of person to just spontaneously do things like this, and so you could really tell that Bill cared for Omaima, he was very, very sweet to her, and they seemed like they were you know truly in love from what the family was saying from that trip so after the trip that is when Bill and Omaima went back to Bill's penthouse in Texas and they had been knowing each other for about seven days and that is when Omaima said that she started to see Bill's true colors because now that it's been a week of knowing each other she's really starting to see all sides of him and really get to know Bill She said that Bill was very possessive, he was rude, and had a scary temper, as well as frequently sexually abusing her, and these were all traits that her father had, and so this scared Omaima a lot because she was thinking that she had possibly just married her father. So then on November 28th of 1991, on Thanksgiving, that is when Omaima says that Bill had sexually assaulted her, tried to force himself on her, and during this forcing himself on her, he actually placed his hand on her throat and she felt like he was going to choke her. So she grabbed a lamp from the bedside table and whacked it over his head and when that didn't work, she took a pair of scissors that were also lying on the bedside table and stabbed his side and this stab to his side is what actually ended up killing Bill. So then on December 1st of 1991, um, Omaima's ex from a year and a half ago who lives in Texas gets a knock at his door uh, very early in the morning and when he opens it up, that is when he sees Omaima standing on his doorstep. Now it was very odd to see Omaima because he was under the impression that she lived in California and they also hadn't talked to each other in a year and a half, but he said that when Omaima showed up she looked very disheveled she looked very tired she just did not look like herself because Omaima was the type of girl to always keep up on her appearances and so when he was looking at her he also noticed that there were lots of cuts on her chest her hands and her neck so he grew very concerned for her so he invited her inside to you know calm her down and see what was going on 
So the two of them sat down and that is when Omaima goes on to tell her ex that she was attacked by her husband and she accidentally killed him in self-defense and she can't go to the police because since she's an immigrant, she's scared that they won't believe her story or just deport her altogether. So that is when she asks her ex for help. She says that if you can meet me at the apartment with a truck and help me dispose of the body, in return, I will give you $75,000 and two motorcycles. So the man is obviously very concerned for Omaima. He is very in shock of what he's hearing. So he's, you know, he clearly sees that Omaima is in distress and he was just basically telling her like, it's fine, okay, like for the money and the motorcycles, I'll help you. Like, if you just go back to the apartment, if you wait there until I get there with the truck, like, don't go anywhere, just stand out front, I will come with the truck and I will help you. Like, it's all gonna be okay. And so, Mima's, you know, she's calming down, she's like, okay, okay, like, I'll, I'll go to the apartment, I'll wait for you. Omaima gets in the red Corvette and leaves to go to the apartment, X goes back inside, 911 immediately. <laughs> like, that man was not gonna help her. So he calls the police and he tells them exactly what Omaima just said. He was like, my ex just showed up at my door saying that she killed her husband and she's asking me to help her. This is where she's at. She's right outside of her apartment with a red Corvette. You can't miss her. So he basically just tells the police all of this. And then when the police get to the apartment, they see Omaima in the red Corvette in front of the apartment. So the police show up and they ask her what she's up to, you know, just asking her regular questions and she says she's just hanging out and when they ask her like hey where's your husband she then says that her husband is on a business trip right now and that's when one of the officers notices a duffel bag lying on the passenger seat so the officer asks Omaima hey do you mind if I take a look in there and when the officer opens up the bag inside was a pair of human lungs wrapped up in a black garbage bag. So the police officer is obviously very thrown back. He starts asking Omaima all these questions and Omaima tries to say that the human lungs were not her husband's and it was actually the lungs of a person that her husband had killed and she was simply just disposing it for him. So the police immediately arrest Omaima and take her into questioning and while she's in questioning, that is when the police officers get a warrant to search the apartment. Don't worry, it's still me just thinking the sponsor of today's episode, Policy Genius. In an unpredictable economy, life insurance can be very important and offer peace of mind if you have anyone that relies on you financially, like a child, parent, or business partner. Life insurance can get more expensive with age, so it's best to start now. Even if you have life insurance through work, sometimes that's not enough when you're trying to cover your whole family. And I know you're probably thinking, but there's so many life insurance companies out there. How do I find the one that is perfect for me and my budget? Well, look no further. Thanks to Policy Genius, they can help you out with that. Policy Genius is an insurance comparison website that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies to find the best insurance for the lowest price. You can save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Just head to policygenius.com and get personalized quotes in minutes with the help of licensed agents at Policy Genius that works for you and not for the insurance companies. The amazing agents Agents are beside you the entire process to answer any questions and help you really understand your options so you can make the decisions with confidence, which I personally think is great because life insurance in general is very confusing and some people may have tons of questions about it and just don't know what certain things mean and so thanks to Policy Genius, they help you out. Head over to PolicyGenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes today and see how much you can save. The crime scene, I want to give a quick warning. It does have to do with a lot of human remains and human body parts, specifically severed and decapitated human body parts. And I know that sometimes that can be very nauseating for people. So just want to say that's what's 
going to happen right now. The police walk in and they report they get a terrible smell immediately and knew something was wrong. Looking around the apartment, they see that it looks very, very disheveled. There are objects lying all over the place as if there was some sort of debacle going on. They look at the couch and there was a huge blood stain on the couch. It just seemed like there was definitely a fight going on in here. And so that is when they make their way to the bedroom and in the bedroom they see blood all over the bed as well as both of the bed posts being broken broken off. There was blood on the carpet as well and when they walked into the bathroom and turned on the light, that is when they saw Bill's limbs hanging on a clothesline in the bathroom shower. When they made their way to the kitchen, the sight was equally as frightening. They saw pieces of Bill's body lying all over the kitchen and it was actually mixed in with Thanksgiving food as if she was trying to make a Thanksgiving meal out of Bill's body. They found both of his hands in the deep fryer again as if she was preparing a meal. They also spoke with the neighbors to just take note if there was any commotion or fighting and the neighbors said that the only odd thing they heard was for the past two days since Thanksgiving, they have heard the garbage disposal going on non-stop as if someone was trying to put something down there that the garbage disposal just couldn't take or it was clogged. The neighbors didn't really think too much of this though, they just assumed that maybe they had plumbing issues but they did remember hearing that. Now, as far as the autopsy, um, I couldn't really find exactly where they found Bill's body. I believe it was just somewhere in the apartment, but from the autopsy um, of what was left of Bill's body, they found rope marks around both of Bill's ankles, thinking back to the bedroom where they found both of the bedposts broken off. It is believed at that some point in this debacle of whatever was going on, uh, Bill was indeed tied up to the bed. There was about 140 pounds of Bill's body missing, and that included the limbs from his upper torso, his head, his genitals, and both of his hands. And also, same thing with Bill's body, I was really trying to see because they found his hands in the deep fryer, but they weren't able to find his genitals, I don't think. And from what I was reading, I don't think they found his head either. I think she disposed of that somewhere outside the apartment, but couldn't remember where she disposed of it at. So even to this day, I believe no one knows where Bill's head or genitals are at. But what was really concerning though to the medical examiners is how clean these cuts were. From the medical examiner, he said that this did not look like someone who was just having a random moment of rage. The cuts were not rough or jagged. They were very clean and purposeful as if this person had done this before. Whoever was doing this knew a lot about the human body and knew exactly how to remove limbs from upper torsos as well as decapitation of a head and removal of both hands and his genitals as well as his lungs. And so removal of the limbs and lungs are not easy things to do and if you are like angry or you don't really know what you're doing, the cuts are going to be very rough and jagged but in this case, it was very clean and it was like she knew what she was doing. So going back to Omaima, Omaima is currently in the interrogation room being questioned by police. And as they're asking her questions about what happened or her relationship with Bill, they noticed that her story kept 
on changing repeatedly. She kept on rambling about nonsense and would just continuously talk about nothingness. Uh, sometimes she was speaking about Bill in past tense and present tense. Some points she said that there was a demon in her head that was telling her what to do and other times she said that she blacked out and can't remember things at all. She also claims at one point that an Egyptian spirit had gotten into her head and taken over her body and it was actually the Egyptian spirit that made her kill her husband and cook him. She said that she had cut him up because if his body parts were scattered then his soul could not pass over and he wouldn't flourish in the afterlife. Now going back to the crime scene they saw Bill's body parts mixed in with Thanksgiving food and this food was found everywhere in the kitchen. It was found on the table, it was found in the fridge, in the freezer, in the trash. But no matter how many times Omaima had switched up her story, had said one thing and then contradicted herself, there was only one thing that stayed consistent with all of her timelines and that was the fact that Bill had attempted to sexually assault her and she reacted out of self-defense. They also took pictures of the scratches on her chest, neck, and hands, and again, these seemed like very clean cuts. They didn't seem like cuts of someone scratching her, and so then they assumed that these cuts were actually coming from the knife as Omaima was butchering Bill. So then in December of 1992, that is when Omaima's trial began. There was no doubt that Omaima had committed the crime. Obviously, she had committed the crime, but the argument stemmed from if she was doing it consciously and intentionally or if she was not in the right state of mind and having some sort of psychotic break. Omaima's defense team said that they believe Omaima was being sexually assaulted by Bill, but in the heat of the moment with Bill reminding her of her father and now sexually assaulting her, Omaima snapped because she got memories of when she was a little girl being assaulted by her father and from there when she hit the lamp over Bill's head and then stabbed him in the side, she started to experience a disassociative trance for three days and when she came to, she realized what she had done and unfortunately it was too late so in a panic she went to her ex's house to help her. After stabbing Bill with the scissors, it was believed that during this disassociative trance, she had cut off his genitals, his head, both of his hands, and put them in the deep fryer. And then that is when she removes all of Bill's limbs from his torso and hung them up on the clothesline that was found in the bathroom. And she takes the rest of his body, as I said, 140 pounds of Bill's body was gone, and she mixes it in with with leftover food from Thanksgiving. Whether or not she ate it, it is unclear, but it was uh, pointed out that during one of her psychology sessions, she had admitted to at one point cooking Bill's ribs and putting barbecue sauce on them and eating them. The prosecutors, the people that were trying to lock up Omaima, said that although Omaima did have a very traumatic upbringing and suffers from some sort of PTSD, that does does not make murdering and eating someone completely just. They also noted that there was no evidence to prove that Bill was an abuser to Omaima, such as them only knowing each other for three weeks at this point, and if the abuse was as frequent as Omaima was saying, there would be some sort of marks on her body, such as bruises, scratches, welts, but there was nothing on her body besides the cut marks that were found on her chest, neck, and hands. Those are assuming to be from the knife that she was using to to butcher Bill. They also noted that there was no 911 calls, no police reports, or witness statements, and the only witness statements that they could find was from Bill's family, to which Bill's family said that Bill and Omaima seemed to be very in love. 
And to just put like my personal take on that, I feel like there are a lot of abuse cases that go unnoticed due to lack of evidence, but I don't think people understand that just because the abuse isn't being shown to the world doesn't mean it's not going on behind closed doors. There are a lot of abuse cases where they seem like a happy couple to everyone else, but behind closed doors is when the abuse actually happens. So, of course, there are going to be no witness statements and sometimes the guy or the girl in that situation is just too scared to speak out. They're scared of what their partner will do to them. So, of course, there would be no 911 calls, no, you know, police reports because things like that are very, very scary. And I feel like if you are in an abusive situation, you know how scary that could be. So, I just wanted to say that real quick because I feel like the prosecutors were saying like, if no one saw anything, then it didn't happen, which I personally don't believe, but I just basically said what the prosecutor said because that's what was a part of the trial, but I also wanted to give my own thoughts on it. So, Omaima's defense team, however, tried to paint Omaima to be this beautiful young woman who had a terrible history with men along with a rough upbringing and she went from the abused to the abuser. The prosecutors also mentioned that with Omaima's history of men, it seemed like she was very numb to to all of her actions against men, including the actions of Bill Nelson. They said that she has shown no empathy for any of the men due to her history of stealing men's money, pretending to be in love with them for money, moving in with them, and making them fall in love with her purely for a financial gain, and all while she had no remorse or no guilt for any of the men that she had manipulated or broke their heart or had left them nearly broke for another man. They also noted that Omaima had a very lengthy criminal record prior to this incident and she had committed several crimes including two counts of auto theft, shoplifting in 1987, a hit and run with property damage on July 31st of 1989. She also shoplifted again and battery for biting a security officer in 1989. She got a DUI in 1990 and she also had an assault with a fire arm charge in November of 1990, just a year prior. So, Omaima takes the stand and she says her reasoning was all due to the trauma that she had endured when she was a kid and she felt like every relationship with a man that she had gone into thus far, the man always ended up being very possessive and abusive and so when she met Bill, she said that she truly did love Bill and she felt like Bill was just different from every other guy that she had been with and so immediately she decided to marry Bill because she thought that this was truly her soulmate. She said that Bill at first treated her with kindness, respect, and loved her, but it wasn't until about a week into the relationship where she started to see Bill's true colors and she had the realization that she had actually married her father and she was now in her mother's position and scared to leave him. She does admit to taking money from men in the past, but that was purely just all in her past. And she said, quote, I am no monster. She also goes on to say that this is not something she wanted to do or would have done if she was in the correct mind state. She said that in the moment of the attack, she just wanted him to stop and things got out of hand and she never meant to kill him. She said that she's very regretful and in the moment, it was either her life or his life, so she did what she needed to do. So the court then asked her if this was all purely out of self-defense and a moment of rage, why did you continue to cut out his body and cook his body and even hang up his body on a clothesline in the bathroom and continued this for the next three days as well as putting some of his body into a garbage disposal? She said that she cooked him to conceal his identity so that no one could find him. So that's why she cut off his head and his hands. She thought that 
that if she cut off his hands and his head, then there would be no fingerprints, there would be no way to identify him, thus nobody could link the rest of Bill's body back to her. Which, in my opinion, sounds very calculated. It sounds like something you would do or think of if you were in a sane mind state. She also said that she cut off his genitals as revenge because that's what he used to hurt her. So, after Omaima's explanation and the prosecutors and her defense team, that is when the jury did acquit her of the first degree murder, but they did say that cooking someone, cutting up their body, and putting that body into a garbage disposal and a deep fryer is not considered self-defense. Bill's family was there, and Omaima said to the family, quote, I'm sorry I dismembered his body. I crossed the reality line, I saw the blood, and I freaked out. I'm not here to justify what I did. I was just temporarily insane. And so it was a very confusing point in the case. They didn't know if Omaima was actually in a, you know, disassociative mind state or was she actually sober throughout all of this. There were a lot of things to show that she was just having some sort of break and didn't know what she was doing. And then when she came to, she realized it was too late. While other things suggested that she knew what she was doing she was taking her time with it and she is just scared she got caught and so it was a very confusing point in the case like this case could go both ways honestly and so then on March 18th of 1993 that is when the jury eventually came to a verdict and found Omaima guilty for the murder of Bill Nelson and was sentenced to 28 years to life. She was sent to prison and was eligible for parole in 2006, but she was denied parole because of the reasonings that the court gave. The board or the court cites Omaima's behavior whilst incarcerated. They said that she was a very big troublemaker in prison, such as violations for fighting inmates, battering a staffer, hiding contraband, stealing, arguing, and quote, not being in compliance with grooming standards. So basically, she was just protesting that she had to like take showers and stuff. The court also, quote, took into consideration the facts of the case, Nelson's criminal history, and her lack of responsibility, remorse, rehabilitation, and self-improvement whilst incarcerated. And apparently, even while she was incarcerated, she was still manipulating men and taking all of their money because she had continuously engaged in the habits of having relationships including conjugal visits meaning that like people would come to the prison or they were like people that were already in prison that she was meeting up with with specifically older men for purely financial gain. Bill's daughter Margaret Nelson was at Omaima's 2006 parole hearing and that is when she basically said that she was 15 years old a high school sophomore when her father was taken from her and every day she has to live without her father. She says that when she graduated high school, her father was not there. When she grew up, her father was not there. When she became a mother, her father was not there and that was something that she has to live with for the rest of her life and Omaima should suffer the same exact consequences as her. In 2011, Omaima was eligible for parole again, but when she applied, she was denied due to, again, her making men fall in love with her for financial gain. It was actually said that she fell in love in prison with a 70-year-old disabled man. I think they're just like prison visits. Like, if you guys are both in prison, you're like able to meet with each other. And she basically had this relationship going with this 70-year-old disabled man until eventually that man grew older and passed away in prison, but somehow Omaima was able to convince this man to make her the beneficiary of all of his money. So even though he was in prison, when he died, 
all of his money went to Omaima and all of his money is still going to Omaima. And the family of this man were very angry with Omaima that she basically took all of his money and now his family gets none of that money. And although I think there are certain things that you can do, like if the person is in prison, I don't think they can gain control over the money or maybe there's like a way for them to fight that in court. I'm not sure, but that is indeed what happened. The old man made Omaima his sole beneficiary, and then when he died, all of his money went to her. She still resides in prison where it is believed she will spend the rest of her life, but she will not be eligible for parole again until 2026. So I guess we'll just see in like four years if she is released or if she remains in prison. So that is the end of today's story. If you guys found this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're on YouTube or if you're on Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts, make sure to rate it five stars because it really helps me out a lot. And I would really like to know your guys' thoughts and opinions on this case because to me, it was a very confusing case because in this case, I believe that she did suffer some sort of dissociative trance when all of this was going on. Maybe she didn't know what she was doing while she was doing it. And that's why, you know, two days later, she went to her ex's house in a frantic because that's when she finally came to and realized what she had done. I don't think she would have voluntarily outed herself out like that if she knew what she was doing was wrong. But at the same time, there are certain things that makes me think that maybe she was conscious of what she was doing. I mean, she specifically cut off his heads and hands so that the police wouldn't be able to identify him and link the murder back to her. She also cleanly cut open his body and made it into food. She also hung up his limbs on a clothesline in the bathroom. And she also allegedly had tied him to the bed due to the broken bedpost and the rope marks found on his ankles. I feel like those rope marks on the ankles are also something you just can't ignore. If her story of the lamp and the scissors is true, why was he being tied up with rope? Um, so things like that, it does make me think that maybe she was semi-aware of what she was doing, or maybe she was just in a trance. So let me know what you guys think below. Do you think that she deserved a life sentence in prison? Do you think that she should have went into a mental health institution rather than a prison? Do you think she deserves to stay in prison? Let me know what you guys think because this case was also very very interesting to me to see how everything turned out and I was honestly very surprised that she wasn't, you know, found not guilty for reasons of insanity, but I don't know. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to be safe out there. Um, drink some water, go outside, read a good book, give someone you love a little hug today, okay? <laughs> and I will see you guys next week. Bye.